Hey gang, we're in South Carolina now. We are at Magnolia Cemetery in Charleston. And we're here today to find the graves of the crew of a very famous Confederate submarine. Actually, the first submarine that sunk a warship in this country, the H.L. Hunley. So let's take a walk. I'll tell you the story. And in the meantime, we will look at some graves. And this, where we start right out, is a very interesting one. You see the entry is flanked by two upside-down cannons. And what's notable for William Washington here, and it says cowpens at the bottom, is there is a snake wrapped around there. Unfortunately, and it looks like a rattlesnake, but unfortunately the head has been knocked off or came off. I will, sad to say, I will bet somebody just came and snapped it off. You know how things go. Lack of respect. So, yeah, the H.L. Hunley is a very interesting story and really it's the reason I wanted to come here to the cemetery and come to Charleston, which is kind of, it's a shipping, we're right by the shipping area. It's very interesting. We're talking about the Civil War and it really, this story really starts out in New Orleans. It was in 1861, the beginning of the war, Union General Winfield Scott, he set up this thing called Operation Anaconda. And basically it was to strangle the South. You know, if you look at a map, it's, it's like a snake. He basically shut down the Mississippi River, wraps all the way around like a line, all the way to the Gulf, around Florida, up and around all the Southern states to deny them any shipping, you know, and it's like any war strategy, you want to shut down the supplies. And if you can choke the enemy, then... So the Confederates were pretty desperate and they had to come up with some innovations. Let's take a quick look at this pyramid. Look at this, it's massive. It's got some beautiful stained glass stained glass here. Let's walk around to the front and see what we can see inside. Look at those doors. Wow. Well, you can see inside and there are crypts. There are crypts in there. Very interesting. The some of the markings, Thomas Whaley, MD, 1870 to 1918. And this is in memory of Francis Susan, loving and beloved wife of WMB Smith, 1820-1886. There's another one here, you can't really read it. So they were pretty effective early, early in the war once that strategy got going. And the Confederates, they had to come up with some innovations, just like any adversary, when, you've, when, you've, when you're getting cut off, you're, you've got to think of new new ways to deal with the situation and that's where they came up with the idea well basically what they did was there were you know they had they were offering money and it was really free enterprise and guys coming forward and investors and there was a a guy named McClintock who came forward and he was kind of leading an investor group he was an inventor and they invented the submarine 
called the Pioneer, and it's a long pointy thing. And in New Orleans, they had it in the Mississippi River. They put it together. They were running the submarine. They were doing test runs, and everything was actually going pretty good. But the problem was that after they got their first tests in Lake Pontchartrain, the Union forces led by Admiral David Farragut were moving in and they were about to capture New Orleans so they had to take it to the middle of the lake and they had to sink it. They had to abandon it as the Union moved in. Of course they wanted to keep it a secret from the Union. And by the way, the Union was working on submarines also, it's another story but they were a little bit behind the Confederate States. So these guys went back to work. They went to their shop. They got out of there. They went to Mobile, Alabama. And this is when a man comes into the picture named George Dixon, a lieutenant. Now, a little digression on George. Who is George? And he really comes into play in the story. And for me, it's probably the the most poignant part of this whole story. Before all this, he was in the Battle of Shiloh. Now, he had married a woman named Queenie Bennett, and she gave him a $20 gold coin. In the Battle of Shiloh, he had it in his pocket, and he was hit by a ball, which would have killed him, but it hit the coin right on, dead on. The coin got dented, saved his life, and it's something that would come into play later. So he went on, he's got this coin, he carries it everywhere. And he's working on the sub, he's one of the key guys. And let's go this way, let's look at some of these mausoleums. Look at this, now I think people are buried under the floor. Now by the way, we're a cemetery channel not a documentary channel so we make little stops and if you want to watch documentaries you, there's lots of YouTube on the Hunley you can watch but we're a cemetery we're here for the cemetery telling stories so they're working on the blueprints they've got the blueprints and they improve the design and they make this new submarine they call the American Diver so they're in Mobile Bay and they're making all kinds of progress tests and of course the Union ships are sitting out there blocking them and they just can't wait they just can't wait to get out there and try this thing out which they do so they put the plan into action they get into the mouth of the bay they're stalking a ship they had the top hatch is open and all of a sudden this big swell comes and goes over and the thing fills up down she goes everybody did get out of that sub sub was lost though so they had to they didn't give up they had to start over again so they built a third submarine and they improved the engineering even some more and I'll tell you about that summer once we have a little look inside here. Look at this. There's a hole in the floor, and I think this is typical. Oh, look at that. It goes way down. Way down, that's where the crypts are. There's no coffins in there, so they must have been taken out. But look at the shelves. Look at all the shelves. So they built this sub with basically eight, it was for eight guys that would sit on this bench. And they would sit shoulder to shoulder on this bench. And there was this crank. And they would all kind of do this or in reverse do this together by candlelight. Can you imagine? In this iron tube that was really pounded out from a boiler. It's like a floating iron coffin. And these guys would just sit there 
Now it had a snorkel system. It had a, it had oxygen, but it didn't work. So they basically had when they submerged, they had a ballast tank. They would have to like breathe slow and not use up as much oxygen as you know. But you know the problem is as the oxygen declines, the carbon monoxide increases. It's like a double whammy. So he had about an hour, maybe two hours max, inside this floating iron coffin. Uh, you talk about brave. I, well, I've been on a submarine, one of the modern subs, well, World War II, and let me tell you, I got super claustrophobic. I had to get out of there. Once that thing started rocking in the waves at the dock when a boat came by. Vanderhorst. Let's take a look inside there. Look at that beautiful floor. There are crypts back there. Look at that. Looks like three. It's like the Egyptian revival. What do you think? Let's go this way. So, Dixon was supposed to be in charge. This was called the Porpoise, and they were going to make this run for the Confederate Admiral Franklin. Buchanan, like a test run to show off what they'd done. So everything's going as planned. They go out there. Now what they're doing is they're dragging an explosive and a long rope, and the, the theory is to go under the ship, and the explosive drags maybe so many hundred feet behind, and then blammo. And what's good is you're out of the blast area. And they do it. They, they have a successful test. Everything goes good. Admiral's impressed. Let's do this. But the explosives doing it that way, especially at the winds and the currents, it was really hard to control. So they devised another method by basically a large, a large harpoon they would have on the front nose. I think it went out about 20 feet or so. And then it had like a barb, it was like a, a, a whale harpoon, triple barbed. And then a huge explosive, a hundred and some pounds of black powder, like a, a keg mine. Crazy. But the idea was to hit the ship with it and then back out and release the harpoon. And then there was a big long string. And then when you're safely backed away, pull this, or actually probably automatically, you get a certain distance. And it's the tension on the string at the end of the, or the rope will set off the charge. So they're sitting there in Mobile, Alabama, and there's just no action really happening. But Charleston here is an under siege. So they're like, let's move the, the ship, the little sub. Let's get it to Charleston where we can do some real damage. So they come here and they, they take it by rail. This was in 1863 now, right in the middle of the overall war. So they're doing testing, they're moving out. And you've got a Lieutenant James A. Payne at the helm. You've got eight other volunteer recruits. They move from the dock. Everything's going fine. They're heading for deeper water. And there was a choppy water. And there was a swell. And unfortunately, it was created by a passing steamer. And it caught them by surprise. They didn't have time to close the top hatches, so it quickly filled with water and sank. Now Payne, of course, he's by the hatch. He gets out. Two others behind him get out. But the other five 
were trapped. And you could imagine like a funnel, they're all trying to get out and they probably, as with the case of many shipwrecks and sinkings with passengers where everybody just freaks out and at the pinch point, the stairs or the exit, they all funnel in and squeeze themselves into a plug. So now Beauregard, he's like, you know, all, you all know Beauregard. He is the big general, the big honcho. And he's like, no more of this. All right, we, we, we can't like go down this. We gotta we have these civilians. We, we, we're gonna take over these test runs. So this time H.L. Hunley, who by the way is one of the major investors, he and Dixon are the guys leading the charge on this. And they're like, Dixon needs to be the guy. He needs to be running the submarine. He's the guy that needs to do the test runs and then the attack. So they're doing a test run and H.L. Horace Hunley steps in for Dixon. He's like, you know, I want to take her out. I've got this one. So he takes it out. And unfortunately, he's at the controls and they're doing this mock attack. And on October 15th, 1863, it went out, it submerged, and it just never came up. All hands lost. So the submarine was raised and the bodies were recovered. They gave them the military honors, the funerals, and more test runs. They're not giving up. Now, it came to be that on the night of February 17th, 1864, was a perfect night to go out for a mission. George Dixon at the helm with his lucky coin in his pocket. And there among the other ships out there in the bay stood this very, very beautiful plump target, the USS Housatonic, very large ship. So they snuck up on the ship. Everything was going good. They had their harpoon ready and they're coming in stealthily, but they were spotted. They were spotted, but they were spotted when they were super close to the Housatonic and there was nothing they could do. They couldn't point the cannons low enough. So they started shooting them with small arms fire and kept coming in and they delivered the load, bang, right into the hull, stuck it. Conceivably, they started backing out. And the next thing you know, there is a massive explosion. Boom, that ship goes down in three minutes. I think there were five hands lost, which isn't bad considering, but mission accomplished. Now, of course, they're all watching from the shore, the Confederates, and they're all cheering. Yeah! And some say they saw a beacon light from the Hunley, but then it slowly just disappeared. It slowly just disappeared. And Sadly, it was never heard from again. And nobody knew what happened. Well, now fast forward, I think it was 2001. A guy named Clive Cussler, you've heard of Clive Cussler, the books, famous shipwreck hunter. Well, he found her. And it was not where everyone thinks, it was a ways away. It wasn't heading back to home. It was kind of just like off on another course. And the only reason he found it where other people didn't find, why other people didn't find it, it was because he was using a magnetometer instead of like sonar or divers. And why was that effective? Why was that key? Because the Hunley was buried under three feet of silt. You never would have found it. So hats off to Clive, he found it. And of course the Navy moved in. They said, we're taking control of this. We own this under Spoils, Spoils Act, so that's okay. I mean, this was for national history. I'm sure Clive was cool with it. And they recover the Hunley. That's right, they bring her, and they bring her ashore, 
And she now sits in a museum. And by the way, we're going to take a look at that museum. We're going to see if we can see the Hunley because she's preserved. Now here's where the story gets just absolutely amazing. The anthropologists and all the experts get in there and they really take their time and they find that the bodies in there are all lined up. Nobody panicked, nobody ran for the, the hatch. Nobody was banged around. Everybody, it was like eerie there. And of course, their, their bones are frozen in silt. The bones that many bones were left in their original position, especially Dixon. Dixon was absolutely preserved in his seated position. He didn't try to even get up. And to make a long story short, through all the, you know, everyone thought it sunk and they drowned and this and that. And that the bomb, when they released the bomb, it, or maybe, you know, it, it broke the ship or maybe one of the lucky, they call it the lucky shot theory. Maybe, uh, you know, they got the, a bullet, but it would take an hour to sink if a bullet hole did it from the small arms. And what they determined through all the extensive analysis, and no one's going to know for sure, but it's like 90%, that these guys just died from the thermal force, the, the force of the explosion, which are like sonic, you know, it's concussion. It's not concussion where it blows your head against the wall and breaks your skull. It's just the waves that pass through your body. The, term called blast trauma. It's really the waves. And conceivably, if you think about it, what happened was then that the sub just didn't sink and it was just drifting off in the current. And these guys were dead. They were dead at the wheel right away. So that's probably what happened. And the coolest part of the story, the coolest part of the story is they found George Dixon, of course, and I think on the floor under his bones, they found the coin with the inscription. And by the way, he had an inscription put on it after Shiloh, the famous inscription, my life preserver with the date. Wow, they found the coin. That is just amazing. There by that tempest of dust, we've got the wind really picking up. These are all the graves. The men. Right here is beautiful corner in this circle on the southeast side of the cemetery. So there, there you see a line of of eight men, which are the the final crew. Let's start over here with the first crew. The crew. The partial crew that didn't make it, most of the crew, I should say, and these are their graves. Absolom Williams, John Kelly, Frank Doyle, Michael Kane, and Nicholas Davis. And it says they're first crew of the H.L. Hunley and that date of August 29th, 1863, and they have a nice monument back here commemorating them. By the way, we have some very small stones here with other people. This is Thomas Park, who lost his life in the something of Charleston Harbor, October 15th. 1863, H33. Now, I don't know the story. Guys, you experts on the story, chime in. So this is the Hunley crew where Dixon was supposed to be in charge on that mock attack test run. Horace L. Hunley, Robert Brockbank, Joseph Patterson, Thomas Park, Charles McHugh, Henry Beard, John Marshall, and Charles Sprague. And here on the left, well, we have some very small stones here, which are marked by Confederate flags.
And then we have the, all the men here. And we'll take a look at that after we look at this marker. So here are the names. What a fine job they did for these men. I think they had a huge, when they finished all the autopsies, if you will, in anthropology, they had a big ceremony out here for these men. Joseph Ridgeway, James Wicks, Jay Miller, J.F. Carlson, S-E-N, uh, Frank, and I can't see, there's a wreath here. Frank Collins. Lumpkin, Arnold Becker, and George E. Dixon, the hero. All heroes. All heroes. Well, rest in peace, gentlemen. Thank you for your service. On both sides, we recognize right or wrong. It's our history of our country and they were all brave men. And that's the story of the H.L. Hunley. We are at the location of where the H.L. Hunley is now. This is the Warren Lash Conservation Center, basically the Friends of the Hunley. And Right within those walls, way over there actually, is where the submarine is, under 75,000 gallons of water. So let's go inside, let's go check it out. Okay gang, we are gonna start right up front here. This is basically the entry of the museum. And right up front here, they have the original submarine called the Pioneer. This was the sub that they built, the first one they built, prototype, in New Orleans. And actually what you're looking at here is a replica that was done later by the exact blueprints from the ship. But look at this little mini conning tower, this port. Can you imagine sticking your head in there? It looks like it's about 13 inches by 13 inches. Here you see the dive planes, which were operated inside there. And they basically had two sticks, kind of like a, a yoke on an airplane. And one would be for the dive planes and the other would be for the rudder in the back. Here's the hatch right here. And this ship basically was the one I was talking about that they were they were in New Orleans and they were testing it out on the Mississippi River and then into Lake Pontchartrain and they had to sink it on the Delta because the Union forces were moving in. So let's move from here to the museum. All right. So we're going to do things a little differently. And we're going to go right to the H.L. Hunley, and then we're gonna come back to this area, which has a lot of the post artifacts. All right, gang, we are entering the sanctuary of the H.L. Hunley. Hello, sir, what's your Hi, name? I'm Bruce. Bruce, welcome to Faces of the Forgotten. Bruce is gonna give us a quick little overview of some of the artifacts here. Good. So. What we see here is these are artifacts that were uh, recovered from Lieutenant Dixon, who was the last commanding officer from his remains. So you can see a pair of binoculars or opera glasses. Then over here are um, the um, connection points for his suspenders. And then um, there are some buttons. And then over there's a pocket knife and then a couple of other buttons. These are actual artifacts that this exhibit we opened up Thanksgiving of 2021. And those are off Dixon. These are off Dixon. Now we've got thousands of artifacts that have been recovered, but a lot of them are really, really sensitive and fragile. 
we don't have the um, the, the the atmospheric equipment necessary in order to be able to place them on display which is why we don't have a lot on the floor okay thank you all right we are going to head up the stairs here we're going to wait for the the display to stop talking and then we're going to head right up there all right we are going to go up the little narration up there is about finished and so we're approaching a tank that's 75,000 gallons of fresh water, 2% sodium hydroxide, which has constant action on the iron. Cast iron boiler they made it from, or at least the original one. And in that spot, and the Hunley and her crew rested there's, for There it is, guys. There it is. That is the actual H.L. Hunley. Please exit down the stairs to see Captain Dixon's And as you look, artifacts. you can see as you tour the, facility, the hand cranks. To we're going to take a look at a mock-up of one of those, of this downstairs. So there's the rear hatch. And if you look really close, if you look really close, there are little tiny porthole windows, one forward, one aft, one on each side, starboard and port. Again, here's a view of the, the hand cranks and Bruce was telling me that they would scrape their knuckles on the other side there if they weren't careful. And how does Bruce know that? Because these guys would, when they take rest breaks, they get together and they made notes now that's where the captain would sit, just aft of the forward top hatch with the same portals. Look at that, guys. Unbelievable. Well, it's in remarkably good condition. Let's take a look at the back there where the propeller is. It looks like the propeller's bent. And wow. All right, we're gonna we're gonna go downstairs now, and we're gonna look at a mock-up, and we can go, if you will, sit inside, just like right there in that position of the HL Hunley. Okay, guys, this is for me the best part. Bruce is gonna show us the coin. Remember the coin I was telling you about that George Dixon had? He had it in his pocket. Here it is. This is the real thing. Now remember what I was telling you that the bullet, the, the bullet, it was shot. He was shot. He had this in his pants pocket, which was this thick wool, and it stopped the bullet. It was a 50 caliber ball or bullet. Was it a bullet or a 50, ball? 58 caliber. This is a 58 caliber mini ball. Wow. This was used by both the Union and the Confederacy during that period of time in the war. You can see it's not a, it's not a BB. It's a real. Wow, that's piece massive. Of, it's a real bullet. And there's also a ring and a, a brooch. A brooch that would be worn on a lapel. That was his. And, and you were telling me in those days, it was common for... Gentlemen of some economic means would go and purchase items like this. So when they go out and socialize in the evening, it was like an advertisement. You know, I'm not, I'm not living on twigs and dry leaves. Right, type of thing. right. It was, yeah, it was not like today. Right. Now look, one more thing before we go, and look at that, the coin is bent. And remember, when the archaeologist was going through very carefully, she was feeling around under George's bones, and she felt something that was odd, and it was this coin. Can you imagine the feeling she had? And if you look here, well, you can't see it here, but I'll bring a picture up of the inscription he made after Shiloh that said my life preserver with his initials underneath and of course above the date of the battle just it's unbelievable so if you get a, a clear shot because that shows the yeah there's the there's the inscription there it is guys my life preserver GED wow all right let's keep going All right, now we are gonna take a quick look at the mock-up and what it would be like for the men who were inside that, that sub. Look at this, look what they built. And 
give you a quick shot of the inside. Look at that. What a great, what a great replica. Let's go inside. Now I'm sitting in one of the seats here right now. And I'll try to, let me turn the camera around. See if you guys can uh, see. So here's the hand crank and I'm holding with one hand, but look at this all together. You know, I, I have this really just, it's a t it's it's really spooky to sit in here. It's it, They said it was about four feet in height yeah, and the, a little less than four feet. The dimensions feet. are 48 inches. 48 inches. Vertical by, height and 42 inches from side to side. Right. And you can, and, and listen, I've got, we've got the windows here. Imagine, you know, I'm trying to imagine this with no windows and in the dark because only only the captain had a lantern uh, lit by candle. Otherwise, it was completely dark in here, and these guys would have to crank, and I, ca I can't even imagine the claustrophobia. Uh, it's, it's, you know, these guys had to be really brave to do this. All right, let's try, let's go to the next, let's go to the next stop. All right, so we're going now to an area that has artifacts that they found after. Now, here's the sling. And this is how they, uh, this is a mock-up of how they brought the Hunley up when they recovered her. Look at that. What a great mock-up. Now wait till you see this, guys. This is, this is a good shot. I like this. Yeah, wow. here's a good uh, drawing of the Hunley. Um, let's take a look at the men. Okay. So we're now going to go over where... Now they did facial reconstruction of some of these men, right? Scientists from the um, Smithsonian Institution, forensic scientists took, forensic scientists from the Smithsonian took information from the geneticists and the anthropologists, the archeologists here, and then took that data along with DNA and constructed these busts of what the gentleman on the last crew might have looked like. And there's George Dixon. He was the commanding officer. That's probably about 80% accurate since we don't really have pictures of them. Right. Yeah, none of these guys had pictures. And they did this from the skulls. From the skulls and from the DNA and the other materials that they recovered. And you said the DNA would tell them what the Eastern European or well, Western European. The way they determined that the lineage was by the way that their teeth were, were the DNA in their teeth. Because right. the diet that you consume ends up in the dentifrice in your mouth and you right. can tell what the principles of the diet were by what their dental records look like right and these are you see the names here guys jf carlson look at that and everybody has very distinguishable and unique features look at this this is miller Very prominent nose. Let's go back to Frank Collins. You were telling me okay. this. This I thought this was a toothpick, but this is a needle. Mr. Collins was a sailmaker before he volunteered and, and became part of the last crew of the Hunley. Sailmakers had needles. They were relatively rare and they were very expensive. So once you got one, you didn't ever let it go. They found this needle in his remains when they were excavating his position on board the ship. And the way that they we they knew he was a sailmaker, and the way that they put the two pieces together, they took the needle, and one of the molars in his lower jaw put the needle in the trench in that molar and fit perfectly. Unreal. So that's how they, they put the needle with his remains, and we know that this was Frank Collins. We know, we know a good deal about some, we know precious little about others. Here we have James Wicks. And lastly, Joseph Ridgway. 
And the most, uh, a couple of notes here. These Medal of Honors were, they, you said that the Confederate States did not have this award. This was later by the Confederate Sons of Confederate Sons. Veterans. Okay. But what's really interesting, I found, Bruce told me that this little uh, scarf, if you will, they actually did recover it, and we're going right. to take a look so over here. So let's go over here. this way. It survived. It actually survived. Look at this. So this is the, the bandana that Mr. Wicks had that's obviously covered in concretion and all kinds of other organic material. That's how they found it. This is an x-ray that they took to determine that it really was a bandana that had fabric in it. And then this is after they finished conserving and preserving it. You can tell that it's actually fabric. So after 130 years underwater, they were able to recover and get to this state. You can really see what it actually was. Fantastic. All right, well, that's gonna conclude our time here. Fantastic, I've got goosebumps from, I've been wanting to see this for so long. I wanna thank Bruce. You're very I welcome. I wanna thank the museum. Uh, Kellen here got us in, great people. You guys gotta come here and see the Hunley.